We have such a great crowd tonight. I'm so excited that so many of you signed up. Okay, it looks like people are getting in. Okay, so we will go ahead and get started. And then um, as people come in, they can just come in. Um, but hello, everyone. My name is Brittany Kerfoot, the Deputy Director of Events at Politics and Prose Bookstore, and I'd like to welcome you all to PNP Live. I have just a couple housekeeping items to go over before we begin the program. First, I'm going to drop a link in the chat where you can purchase your copy of We Keep the Dead Close straight from PNP's website. And if you live in the DC area and you don't feel like waiting for shipping, you can actually select in-store pickup and get it from any of our three store locations around DC and you don't have to pay for shipping. Um, you can also ask a question about the book, the writing process, um, Becky's interview process, or anything else you're curious about by clicking on the Q&A button found at the bottom of your screen. And we just ask that you add your questions there instead of in the chat so we can keep everything nice and separated and straight. All right, it is now my absolute pleasure to introduce tonight's speakers. Becky Cooper is a former New Yorker editorial staff member and of course the author of We Keep the Dead Close, A Murder at Harvard and a Half Century of Silence. It's 1969 and ambitious 23 year old graduate student Jane Britton would be found bludgeoned to death in her Cambridge, Massachusetts apartment. This book is both a rumination on the violence and oppression that rules our revered institutions, a ghost story reflecting one woman's past onto another's present, and a love story for a girl who was lost to history. Moderating the conversation is Ron Chernow, the prize-winning author of six books and the recipient of the 2015 National Humanities Medal. His first book, The House of Morgan, won the National Book Award. Washington, A Life won the 2011 Pulitzer Prize for Biography. And his book, Alexander Hamilton, was adapted into the now hit Broadway musical, Hamilton. So please welcome both of them to PNP Live. Hi, guys. Hi. Thank you, Thank you Brittany. Hello, Becky. I can't tell you folks how proud I am and pleased to appear on the publication date of We Keep the Dead Close with my brilliant young friend, um, Becky Cooper. Let me tell you the story of how I simultaneously got to know Becky and got to know this uh, story. I live in Brooklyn Heights in New York City and back in 2013, once a week I used to have lunch at this charming cafe called Ted and Honey. And I would sit at the counter and there was a very engaging woman behind the counter who would serve me spinach salads and cappuccinos. Uh, any day we discovered that we were both writers and of course, slipped into shop talk and I said, are you working on anything? And she proceeded to tell me that she had graduated from Harvard just a few years before. And that Harvard had circulated for decades, this, these legends about a um, uh, 22 year old uh, archeology span student named Jane Britton, whom you just heard had been bludgeoned to death in her apartment uh, in Cambridge. Uh, and uh, there had always been suspicions that her archaeology professor, who had a name like something out of Count Dracula, Count Lambert Karlovsky, you know, was the uh, villain of the piece. Anyway, I was just hypnotized by the story, and I found that I kept returning every week to Ted and Honey, not only to get the next installment of my veggie burgers and spinach salad, but the next installment of the story of uh, Jane Britton and her um, uh, research. I think it's fair to say, Becky, you know, this uh, story expanded into something, you know, so vast and uh, Byzantine, as in all, you know, great uh, whodunits, your imagination keeps jumping from one suspect to another, and then it just builds to this uh, shattering uh, climax. Um, this is a book, one of those rare books folks, that you will not only read, you will live it uh, as you're reading it. And I think I've said to Becky over the years, you know, usually first books don't change the lives of um, young writers. This one will. I think it will create a sensation. And I think that it will put Becky on the literary map. And I think we will have many more terrific books um, about her. Okay, I'm going to interview Becky for about 40 minutes, then we'll have Q&A from the uh, audience. We have a terrific turnout tonight, by the way. Becky, can you fill in some more of the details about, you know, what the um, detectives found when they uh, discovered Jane Britton? I deliberately omitted some of the more lurid uh, details. Sure, absolutely. Also, thank you for that introduction. I, I found myself back in 2013 doing so much of the research to have something to keep you up. <laughs> you know, I was in between projects and, and hadn't yet 
decided necessarily that I was the right person to write the story and your interest was what kind of catapulted me into Thank that. you, thank you. And thank you all for being here and, and for Politics and Prose. Um, but what did the detectives find? I mean, well, I think what's interesting about Jane's case in particular is the way in which it kind of multiplied into myths. So there's the version of the crime scene that the detectives found, which was that there were um, uh, her fur blankets spread over her body, which was found face down in her bed. There was a headstone that was propped next to the bed, um, a portion of a colonial gravestone that nobody really fully understands where it came from. And it seemed like it had been moved from the place where Jane had kept it in her apartment. And the, and the kind of most lurid detail um, is that there was this red powder, which some believed was red ochre, which is, you know, some people know is a uh, jeweler's rouge, it's iron oxide. Um, it's associated with some of the oldest burials of humanity, um, was sprinkled over her body and kind of splashed up the wall behind her where a headboard might have been. Um, but I say it's interesting that that her, her death kind of multiplied into myths because you know when I first heard the story um, from a friend of mine who told me it as a kind of academic horror story, um, there were other details in there as well, which was that um, the killer had apparently burned her body um, with cigarettes um, in a kind of ritualistic fashion um, and that the killer had placed um, three necklaces on her body as in a kind of perfect recreation of the, the burial that they had found together that summer in Iran. Um, and, and so I think so much of my job was trying to peel back what was true in that original mythic version of the story, which was in this case, the red ochre, the red blanket, the fur blankets and what wasn't true. Yeah, and there were a lot of you know macabre theories about the uh, the red ochre. You know, when you're reading the book, it's a little hard to get past that uh, detail. <laughs> it's so striking. And it also seems to, you know, point uh, to the um, archaeology anthropology department. Can you talk a little bit more about? It? Incidentally, folks, for those of you who don't know, you know, ochre it's it's a it's a reddish um, brown color, which, as you were saying, has been associated with cave paintings and a lot of different uh, ancient archaeological sites. Exactly, exactly. It's what it's also what colors the sort of rusty red mountains in the in the yeah. southwest. Um, you know, when, when detectives first learned about the red ochre, um, or when it, at least it first became public, which wasn't immediately after Jane's body was found, um, detectives explained that it was, it was explained to them as something spread over her body as a way to um, transport her soul into paradise, or that it was in some ways a kind of perfect recreation of a, of a Near Eastern burial ritual. Um, and, and, you know, publicly, the, the head of the museum, Stephen Williams, distanced himself from that theory because he recognized that if that were true, it, it would have seemed to limit the field of suspects to somebody in the anthropology department, which as the head of that department, he definitely didn't want to do. Um, but when the police transcripts came out after the case was solved and I got to look through them, I saw that in private, he had um, not only explained to them the significance of the red ochre and had said explicitly, you know, it seems to me that the killer didn't just kill her, that in fact, he had taken the time to, you know, recreate a ritual over her body. But he also said that it seemed likely that the killer was in one of three camps, that either it was, you know, a hippie, as he said, who had spread red ochre over her body, um, kind of parodying what he or she had read, or it was somebody in his department or it was a random killer who in a fit of psychosis spread this over her body. And, and the museum director said that the last was the least likely, but in public, he said, no, 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 you know, she was a painter. It was just red pigment. It, 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 it was just kicked over in, in, a, in a struggle. But it, it was, you know, it was the clue on which everything turned because that was what made, it turned it all into an Agatha Christie construct where everyone looked at everyone else in this kind of insular world as, a possible killer. Um, so, yeah, I want to talk about the uh, the archaeology department <laughs> and the Peabody Museum. But before we do that, I feel first we should talk about uh, Jane Britton. She's really the center of the uh, story. Um, she emerges as a very uh, compelling uh, figure. That she was obviously a very um, uh, bright woman. Uh, she had a wicked sense of humor. She seemed to have kind of a taste for danger and adventure. She's living a more daring life somehow than uh, other students 
uh, on campus or in the Cambridge area. At the same time, she comes from a fairly conventional family. I think, wasn't it her father was an administrator at, uh, yeah. at Harvard? She, was the vice so president she, of she seems to be kind of torn between, on the one hand, this more conventional life, and on the other hand, something more daring. Can you give us you know, a, a fuller uh, picture of her personality as it emerges in the course of the book? Absolutely. Um, you know, Jane, on the one hand, she grew up, as you said, she was the, the child of the vice president of administration at Radcliffe and of a former professor. And her parents just put an enormous amount of pressure on her and her brother Boyd. Um, and whereas Boyd, her brother, engaged in what he called a campaign of failure um, to try to regain control in his life because he saw that that was the only way. Jane kind of did the opposite and channeled that pressure into her studies. So, you know, in high school, she was voted most likely to succeed. Um, she was the only one to get into Radcliffe. And this was even before her father started working at the college. Um, but, you know, she wasn't this paragon of prim virtue that a lot of the newspapers, at least the early ones, had kind of painted her to be, which, you know, seems now to be because it, it fit better the idea of this kind of perfect victim. They called her, you know, her childhood as American as apple pie or Plymouth rock. Um, but, you know, Jane, as you said, had a wicked sense of humor. She had a, a, a kind of famously foul mouth. Um, you know, even one of her best friends said that her insight was so cutting that she could knock you down with a single line and it kind of bordered on caustic. Um, and she was very sexually independent. You know, another one of her close friends said if a guy, you know, if she found a guy boring, she'd just sleep with him to get rid of him. Um, and, 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 you know, the more I got to know Jane, the more I learned about her, you know, not only did I learn that she was a fiercely loyal friend, um, but I also learned that she seemed to be the kind of person to only show one side of herself at any given time. She had a kind of crystalline personality because even her closest friend said, you know, I'd be very curious what other people who knew her would say to you because I only saw one aspect of it. Um, and I also came to doubt the veracity of some of the stories that Jane told about herself. And so, you know, in a way, one of the mysteries of the book was not only what happened to her, but also who, who was Jane. Um, but, you know, through it all, it was impossible not to love her. You know, one of my favorite quotes of hers is in a letter where she's writing to her parents um, from Iran and the dig that she's on. And she's talking about her her boyfriend, Jim Humphreys, and she says, well, you know, can't say I mind the idea of getting married, but then again, I, I can't say I mind contemplating the idea of pizza when I get home. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, she, she was a free spirit. And part of the um, power of this book is um, your own rather haunting sense uh, of obsession and even identification with with Jane. There's even a kind of this something of a faint resemblance, you know. Yeah. I don't want to <laughs> overstate that, but um, that sense of identification. What was the source of that identification psychologically? You think, and was that um, must have been a bit unnerving to identify <laughs> with Jane, given the outcome. I never really found it all that unnerving. I found it kind of comforting. I found it a kind of companionship. I think the only part of it that was truly unnerving was, was the question of whether my identification was so strong that I was then blinded to the ways in which we were different. And could I write as honest and, and thorough a biography of someone um, if I was just desiring them to be me? And so I think there was a moment after I talked to her brother Boyd for the first time and, and Jane's kind of stubbornly refusing to be me that I, I then step back and, and realize that, you know, not only was my identification too close, but, you know, if I were to continue working on this book, I'd need to kind of find a different foundation for it. But, you know, to answer your question, I think um, the, the fundamental feeling or the fundamental orientation to the world that united me and Jane was a kind of loneliness in her that I think is more than just searching for a kind of romantic companionship. It was a kind of psychic loneliness um, where Jane always felt on the outside of things. Um, and I, I really uh, strongly related to that, especially in a younger version of me. And I think um, I just sort of had the sense that she would be the person at the corner of the party who would go up to somebody who is by themselves and make them feel at home. And, and, and I, had the, I had the impression that she was doing that with me.
Yeah, I should tell people there's a lot of Becky in the book. I mean, <laughs> very kind of, you know, revealing, you know, confessional passages in the book, which I think really um, enrich the book. Now, the, the legend that had circulated for decades, the, the villain of the piece was always this charismatic archaeology professor, Carl Lambert Karlovsky. I love that, uh, that name. And, and for me, throughout the book, he retained a certain dark uh, glamour. I was always happy when he came back into the, uh, the story. And could you tell um, uh, the folks how you uh, infiltrated his class and then kind of against all the odds, uh, you become friends with him. <laughs> Friendship of a sort. I don't know if that, what's the right word. You have a relationship. Uh, yeah. uh, with him. Yeah, you know, Carl, Carl, when Jane started at Harvard, he was a young uh, professor who was very handsome. People called him behind his back, Count Dracula, both because of his name and also because yeah. of kind of rumored heir of European aristocracy. Um, and, you know, people have said over the, over the course of my interviewing them that he was the kind of person not to let a few facts stand in the way of a good story. Um, yeah. And he also, like people talk about him stalking the halls of the Peabody in, in a cape and whether or not that's true, it's it sort of aligned so closely to the kind of larger than life reputation of this professor. Um, and, and, you know, as you said, I inherited this myth, this rumor that had him at the very heart of it, that, that it was very specifically this professor, Jane's professor who had killed her because they had had an affair. Um, and I learned, um, about a year after hearing Jane's story for the first time that he was still on faculty. And so my first impulse was to sit in on his class. Um, and I had graduated already at that point, but Harvard- The title of the book comes from something he said, right? Can you yeah, exactly. Yeah, it was, it was during this class. I, um, I sat in on his class during shopping week, which is when um, you know, professors don't know necessarily who's supposed to be in their class. And I sat you know, two chairs away from him um, and did that for, couple of months and he said during one of the classes describing the people of Ein Malaha um, that they buried the dead under the floorboards of their house and he looked at everyone and said they kept the dead close and I kind of circled it in my notebook but Carl you know the more I looked into the story the less I believed that he was the murderer um, in fact I'm convinced that he's not and so the question for me kind of forked and, and became even more interesting, which was, all right, well, if, if Carl didn't do it, then who did? And also if Carl didn't do it, then why is this the, the person on whom history has decided to pin it? Um, and I was kind of reverse engineering this myth to understand like what, what was the larger truth that was being gestured at here by kind of casting him in a role that he didn't necessarily deserve. Yeah, I think a lot about there's a a quote by an anthropologist named Vina Das, who says, um, some realities need to be fictionalized in order to be apprehended. And I felt like I was working backwards from the fiction, which was Carl did this, into the reality of, of what is this actually trying to gesture at? And yeah, that's I, I, I should, you know, explain to people, you know, the book is much more than who done it or uh, just uh, in, in investigative report. It really becomes sort of a meditation on the you know myths that are you know bred by a particular crime and um, how those uh, myths you know, reverberate in people's minds and uh, how people react to and interpret uh, uh, this and all of the distortions that can occur and how people you know think about different crimes. Let's let's talk about the um, the anthropology world in the the world of the Peabody Museum, which is rather unforgettable in in the book because it's. <laughs> In your hands, as you describe it, it's a world of uh, eccentrics and loners and all sorts of strange characters, you know, drift through that uh, department and that uh, museum. And my sense was that one of the things that, that uh, gives that department and that museum special character is that um, archaeology is a small uh, discipline in terms of the number of people who study it, and hence the number of people, hence the number of tenure positions are very few. Uh, so, um, Competition is a special cutthroat uh, to get uh, tenure, and uh, it's it, it's an anxious world because it's not easy to find a position in the university uh, in um, uh, archaeology the way that it might be, you know, in a larger uh, discipline. Can you, can you talk more about what you learned about uh, that that world? Absolutely. No, I think that's very astute. I think that the number of jobs fostered this intense cutthroat competition, which then turned something that 
you know, academic politics are always kind of complicated, but it, it amplified it even more. And, and, you know, I think um, the Peabody Museum itself, which is where the, which is associated with the anthropology department, um, you know, all, couldn't be a better Agatha Christie kind of setting. There's uh, secret tunnels that are underneath <laughs> the buildings that, you know, students take it as a point of insider pride to know where the molding is to press on to enter various things. Um, you know, people talked about people hanging out in hammocks underneath it. So the whole thing has this kind of cloistered mysterious vibe. And then you add to it this kind of complicated relationship between the professors themselves because anthropology, which is the umbrella um, department houses four different disciplines. It has this archeology, span biological anthropology, social anthropology, physical anthropology. And there's a kind of animosity, as I say in the book from, from being forced to inhabit the same department with very little in common. So you have that kind of interdepartmental fighting. And then if you add on top of that, the fact that until 2005, Harvard didn't have a policy of tenuring its junior professors. Um, that you know, people in fact were kind of told to think of their non-tenured track position as more of a kind of postdoc fellowship than any kind of associate position. So the fact that there seemed to be a couple of positions opening up in 1969, the year that Jane Britton died for possibly a junior professor meant that you know there was an especially kind of combustible atmosphere there and, and Carl Lambert Karlovsky the person that we were just talking about in fact was the last professor of archaeology to be tenured from within at Harvard for the next 43 years. Yeah. Quite astonishing you know we started talking about this um, book Becky back in 2013 these were events that took place in 1969 and one of my concerns uh, initially was that perhaps too many years, you know, had passed to be able to do justice to this uh, story. And I have to say, as I was reading the book, I was astonished by how many friends and family members and colleagues were not only still alive, but still brooding about this. There was this unfinished emotional business for so many of these people who, of course, had no idea that there were all these other people out there who were still dwelling on what had happened and that uh, there was not, um, to use a cliche, there wasn't a sense of emotional closure about this. Was it, um, uh, in that situation, sometimes it's very easy and sometimes very difficult to get people to, to talk. Uh, which was your experience? You know, I think it depended on the person. Um, yeah. Some people felt like they had been waiting kind of 45 years to get this call and had even um, had a kind of third, like a bird's eye perspective on the case where they, they weren't somebody within the story. They were somebody seeing the story for its structure and they were ready to kind of, you know, download it to me. Um, some people I think um, had a tough time talking about it because they didn't want to tell other people's secrets because as you say so much of the book kind of occupies the space of rumor and there's one thing to kind of pass it between people as, as a whisper network and there's another thing to tell it to a journalist and in a way to kind of document it um and there are some people who really very few who didn't want to talk to me at all um one of them was very Jane, few. Yeah. Yeah. Um, jane's boyfriend um who I, I kind of ask in the book whether um, it was one of the more honorable things to do possibly to, to let history speak for itself. Um, but at the same time, I'm enormously grateful to her very loyal friends like Don Mitchell, who I call in the book a kind of sentimental archivist who you know, had Tupperwares of boxes of negatives and letters. And, you know, he was every researcher's dream and he was so generous in, in, in sharing them all with me. Yeah. He was grateful, I think, for the chance as, as difficult as it was, um, as suspicion threatened to turn back onto him. He was grateful for the opportunity to see a story that he had lived trapped inside of from, from, from different vantage points. Yeah, and it turned out that there was an enormous amount of documentation of, you know, all sorts that uh, was out there. You know, I know as a biographer that uh, one of the difficulties of writing this kind of book is on the one hand, you know, in, in uh, doing interviews and dealing with your sources, you want to show in us uh, empathy that people trust you with this story, which is very, very personal uh, to them. On this, at the same time, you want to be, you know, distant enough that you can retain 
uh, objectivity. And I would think that, you know, in this case, because this went on for, you know, many years and required with some people, you know, extended interviews over a long period of time. Uh, was that difficult to negotiate that uh, tension? It was, it was difficult, especially, I think, because I, I take to heart um, what I'm going to paraphrase of Janet Malcolm's, which is that all journalism is an act of betrayal. You know, <laughs> yeah, I was thinking of Janet Malcolm. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, as close as I feel to many of the people in the book, it, it, it was always to me obvious that, that the, the relationship, whatever it was, was founded on this kind of transactional promise where I was coming in as the journalist and that whatever feelings of kind of friendship came over that wasn't ever going to, I wasn't going to let change if I could, the, the kind of fundamental reason that we entered each other's lives in the first place, which yeah. was write as honest and accurate a book as I possibly could. And so I think what was difficult for me was bracing myself for this very moment when um, the people in the book whose friendship I have come to, you know, whose friendship means a lot to me at this point. Yeah. I, I have had to brace myself for the possibility that that may cease to exist because I have written the book that I think is is so honest. But I've been really grateful. I sent I sent Boyd, her brother, a copy of the book and 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 he was very happy with it. And I sent Don a copy of the book and 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 he was extremely complimentary. Um, so, so far I haven't had to sort of sever ties in that way, but I, it, it, it worried me constantly. Well, I find that um, uh, I've so often had the experience, Becky, that you're writing a book and you spend a lot of time worrying how A, B, and C will react. And then the book comes out, A, B, and C are fine with it. It's X, Y, and Z. <laughs> you never imagined we're going to be upset about it. We're suddenly coming out of the woodwork. Very, very difficult to, you know, predict uh, that. I was fascinated. I confess I was completely uh, ignorant of this website called Web Sleuths. Mm -hmm. uh, for those of you who are as ignorant as I was, it's a place on the internet where amateur detectives go uh, and they analyze all of these famous cold cases and they try to do their own uh, research. Can you describe Web Sleuths to people? And, and also, um, did the Web Sleuths, because Jane, the Jane Britton case was, one, was on that site, uh, did any of their leads uh, prove helpful? Um, I also was very ignorant of, of Web Sleuths. I didn't oh, know it existed okay. until, <laughs> until I'm, not, I'm not deep in the true crime internet community of which there are, yeah. there's a lot, it's a big community. Yeah. Um, but, but Web Sleuths is um, a website dedicated to uh, generally murder cold cases and missing persons. And yeah. there are threads that are started for each of the cases and people post on them um, in a kind of message board style, any clues or theories or um, newspaper articles that they find. And, and there's an administrator who, who kind of snips out the most libelous of, of the information, but people are kind of free to speculate. Um, and that's one of the parts of it that I, you know, I never posted on Web Sleuths. I think um, you asked if there was anything helpful that came out of it for me. It was, you know, people posted Jane's um, death certificate, which was helpful. I didn't have to go track it down. Um, they posted a map of, of Harvard in, in 1968. But I, I, I always had a kind of tenuous relationship with it where I, I worried that um, there was a degree to which murder can sometimes seem like a game to solve. Like you're, you're playing a, a yeah. board game almost. Mm. And these, there isn't the sense that these are not only <clears throat> victims who have family members who are still alive, but the people on whom suspicion is being thrown and, and aggregated are also still alive. And there's a, a, a kind of intense responsibility I think that comes from that. Um, in terms of whether they led to anything substantive in the book itself, I think because the book is is as much about the afterlife of Jane's murder, about the about the kind of rumors that cropped up in the forty five up to forty nine years um, that people were waiting for a solution. There was one one of the suspects, not Carl, that the book also focuses on, um, who's uh, kind of messages, um, the messages about whom in the thread um, turned me on to. So it, it is thanks to Web Sleuths that I understood the kind of enormity of that part of the Jane Britton murder, but did it, did it actually lead to 
the correct solution to the case? No, but it was a different, um, it, it had different value for, for understanding the story in its totality. Mm -hmm. Now, people would be interested to know that um, almost like a method actor, you decide that you're going to go on a month long archeological dig in the world places, Bulgaria. <laughs> Uh, and did that experience yield any uh, insights? Uh, what was the reason that you decided to do it? What were you hoping to get out of it? Um, well, I, I was David Remnick's assistant at The New Yorker. And when David heard that I was leaving uh, the job in order to go on a dig in Bulgaria, he said, is that how much you hate me? <laughs> 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 um, no, the, the reason I went on it was because, you know, people kept repeating to me that like, until you've been on an archaeological dig, you can't understand the kind of immersive insanity that happens and how quickly it descends. I, you know, I think now that we've all been in lockdown for, for COVID, we can kind of understand exactly how that feels, which is, you know, both the people who you're completely sick of driving you crazy are also the only people you have social interaction with. Um, and, and the way that kind of petty grievances can turn serious, like, hallucinatorily quickly almost um, was what I learned most I think from being on that dig um, but the other thing was also the way in which um, you can go so quickly from from not seeing anything I remember the the first day I showed up the the dig director apologized for how messy he said the trench was and it looked perfectly pristine to me and it was only over the course of of you know the three or four days that that we started cleaning the site that I could I could start to see the negative traces even like one of the things that I found most fascinating was that, you know, where a post had been 7,000 years ago, even if the post is removed, you can still see where it had been because the dirt is just a little bit colored differently. Um, and so that, that experience of going from seeing nothing to seeing so much, I think also was metaphorically really important for, you know, my experience um, at Harvard, for instance, where the first time through, I didn't see that much. And then the second time through was this kind of exhilarating and difficult process of reseeing. Yeah, well, let's talk a little bit about um, Harvard because you know uh, nowadays we tend to think of uh, Harvard as a very you know diverse and ultra liberal institution, but the portrait of Harvard that emerges in these pa uh, pages is of a uh, certainly very patriarchal uh, institution, kind of rather stuffy, undemocratic, uh, not an open, freewheeling uh, place uh, at, at all. What's your guess in terms of what the um, reaction to the book will be in the in the Harvard universe, or will that kind of vary based on uh, generational differences? I'm honestly not sure. I mean, I think. Um, Harvard, I imagine, will not get caught off guard by it. In, in, in May of this year, um, there was an explosive Crimson article that came out uh, detailing serial sexual misconduct allegations against three of the 21 tenured professors in the anthropology department. Um, and in the wake of that, the, the now head of the anthropology department um, pledged to uh, create a committee to examine the existing power structures within the anthropology department itself that enabled these abuses of power to happen and then to go undetected. So, you know, I think it, the department itself is at least acknowledging that these three male professors are not just three bad apples, but in fact, there's an environment of old structures of power you know, asymmetries, vulnerabil structured vulnerabilities of grad students and junior faculty members that need to be addressed. And, and one of the things that they have changed, um, which I directly address in the book, is that, you know, so many graduate students, their careers are dependent on a single faculty member. And, you know, if that faculty member withdraws their, their support, then they can be kind of, that, that could be the end of their career. They have to change their field or they may even have to leave academia. And so one of the ways that the anthropology department has decided to fix this is that now um, entering graduate students have to align with the research interest of at least three professors um, to mitigate this kind of extreme dependence that can lead to vulnerabilities that make someone, you know, at increased risk of, for example, sexual coercion.
Just I'm going to ask one more question because I see the uh, Q and A starting to, um, uh, to pile up, and that's the a portrait of Radcliffe. Radcliffe may be, for all I know, with kind of you know younger uh, readers, a, a name that they don't even know anymore. And just uh, to uh, explain, it used to be the um, one of the Seven Sister Schools was the sort of female counterpart of Harvard. I'm trying to figure out the best way to kind of, uh, Rykov was to Harvard, like what Barnard, you know, uh, is to um, mm -hmm. Columbia. And I was fascinated uh, by your description of uh, Radcliffe in those days. And I guess it was in about 20 years ago that Radcliffe was folded into Harvard and exactly. Radcliffe ceased to exist as a separate mm -hmm. entity in that uh, way. But you describe a world of uh, curfews and parietals, or they're trying to maintain uh, this very sort of cloistered and ladylike uh, atmosphere. Can you talk a little bit more about that? I'd sort of forgotten what things were <laughs> like. I'm old enough to have you know, lived through this uh, book. I, I, I remember one of the few disputes I had with my checker was in describing, um, I think it was a 1963 scandal, I, I write, that rocked campus, which was that these um, two deans wanted to deal with um, what they saw as a loose moral situation on campus. It was about parietal rules. And my checker had said, is it really a scandal? And I was like, no, in, in, in the minds of, of Harvard and Radcliffe in 1963, I think it was, this really truly rocked the institutions because the deans were saying, you know, we, we want, we promise to deal with promiscuity in the same way we deal with thievery and cheating you know it, this was the biggest deal and then and then a few months later JFK is shot and suddenly yeah. you know, this kind of cloistered world can no longer pretend the external world doesn't exist and um, drugs hit campus the next year and you know the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement start to take hold but but when Jane got there you know I think what was really interesting to me was was talking to people who graduated Jane was class of 67, talking to people a few years older than Jane and a few years younger. And they they almost all described with the outfail each of their classes as being as different almost as generations. Because when Jane got there, it was mandatory skirts and stockings. Um, and when men came over into the halls during those parietal hours, they had to shout man on in the hall, or they had to write out, you know, pink slips for when you missed a call, or you had to write out in this little book where you were going so somebody could call you um, if they needed to. So yeah, it, it, it changed radically over the course of the four years because the within two years um, after Jane passed away. So by, I think it was 70 or 71, the, the dorms had gotten co-ed. And as one person told me, you know, college is always a kind of time where you're exploring the boundaries, um, you know, sex and drugs and, and whatnot, but, but to have the world's more as shatter, shatter at the same time was just extraordinary. Yeah, I had, you know, when I read the book, I had forgotten the term parietals, is that <laughs> used in the universities? It suddenly carried me back many years. I went to the other university. Uh, okay, I'm gonna start asking questions from the uh, uh, audience. Uh, first one from uh, Ruth Fogarty. Did you consciously construct the book as true crime? If so, were you actively subverting some of the genre cliche, specifically that of the innocent girl and the fascinating uh, killer? I, thank you. I really, I really like that question. I think, in fact, I, I, I almost consciously didn't construct it as true crime. I think I thought about it as a biography or cultural history almost. Um, and that was one of the reasons I ended up choosing the editor I did because she was as interested in the, the kind of thematic ways that rituals appear, the ways in which we relate to the dead. And it was only, you know, the murder of course was very important and solving it was, was, was crucial, but it wasn't necessarily, um, the focus of the book at all times. And so for me, you know, the idea that I would try to reconstruct Jane as thoroughly um, and compassionately as I possibly could didn't, it felt inevitable. Um, and, and the fact that I, you know, wouldn't glorify the killer was, it, it wasn't even a, a question, but um, yeah, so no. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it does really transcend uh, any, uh, particular uh, uh, genre. Okay, uh, moving on. Um, uh, Francesco, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly. Francesco Rolando. Uh, thank you so much, Becky. I am just a few pages in and already cannot stop reading. How oh, nice. How is living within the same institution that you were dissecting through your writing? Did it ever make your job harder? 
Oh, well, Francesco, thank you for that question. Francesco was one of my beloved undergrads when I went back to Harvard um, mm. to, to be what was called an elf. I baked cookies in exchange for room and board and one of the most fantastic kind of under the radar fellowship-like opportunities. Um, yeah, it, it, it was tricky, I think, for me to, well, on the one hand, I felt extremely lucky to be able to be back at Harvard, both because it's so easy to make a caricature out of. And I think living there um, grounded me in both my valid critiques of the place. And also I think what I, what I was relieved to find that I still loved, you know, I still loved the undergraduates there. I think they're some of the most remarkable people, but I think, you know, two things were really difficult coming back to Harvard. One was I didn't expect the degree to which I would feel physically vulnerable writing about um, a murder that had taken place on Harvard's campus 50 years later that in some ways throws into question the Cambridge and Harvard police. Um, you know, and at that point the case hadn't been solved. So I felt like I was kind of walking back into a very um, dangerous unknown. On the other hand too, I think it, it was, trying to wrestle with the ethical side of things where I wanted to make sure that I could justify critiquing Harvard while I was benefiting from it. Um, and, and to me, the kind of ethical balance that I found was that it, it, it was from within Harvard that I found myself in a position to be able to critique it most accurately. So that was how I, I balanced it. Becky, here's a, a, a question from our a, a mutual friend, uh, Pam McCarthy from the uh, New Yorker world. Uh, nice that you're here, Pam. Uh, Becky and Ron, great to see you here and thank you for the riveting discussion. Uh, Becky, can you talk about Harvard's role, position, posture during the investigation and beyond? The degree to which the institution closed ranks or not? Thanks, Pam. Thank you, Pam. Um, so, one of the central rumor or aspects of the original rumor was that Harvard had caught wind of the article that the school newspaper was going to write that linked this, you know, rising professor with this murder. And according to the rumor, Harvard censored the newspaper and the art the version of the article that had run that morning by that afternoon was gone. Um, and, 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 you know, journalists working at the time had the sense that Harvard really circled the wagons. Um, they just wanted it to die down and, and go on with life as usual. Um, and other than I think the fact that Harvard truly was embroiled in a scandal about the fact that it owned the building that Jane Britton died in um, and they were um, kind of delinquent landlords, the front doors, the front locks on the building didn't work. And that was in direct violation of Cambridge building code. And I think that was one of the reasons that they wanted this to just go away. I, I couldn't, for all of my years of research, find any proof that they had done anything to impede Jane getting justice, that the, the press blackout that was issued, a kind of unprecedented press blackout uh, issued three days later, um, was not necessarily the result of someone at Harvard calling up the police and saying, you know, we need this investigation to stop happening. But, you know, according to one of the journalists I talked to from the time, he said, you know, the Cambridge police understood how power works in, in the Cambridge community. And, you know, Harvard didn't have to do that. You know, somebody else said around here, Harvard is thicker than water rather than blood. Um, but I think what was really interesting to me was, all right, if, if Harvard didn't necessarily impede justice from getting served here, why was I and so many other people so ready to believe that Harvard had impeded justice in some way. And that that coupled with what one of the other archeology span students had told me about um, Jane's story possibly being a cautionary tale led me into seeing Jane's story as a kind of allegory um, about, about gender discrimination on campus and also the experience of, of, of especially female professors and students who have experienced sexual misconduct and, and of what they called the great enabling by Harvard in which, you know, years of silence or of professors not facing consequences of it, that seeming impunity for their actions is the kind of um, untrustworthy behavior that then leads people to believe that Harvard is this kind of villainous institution um, in Jane's case. <laughs> 
Yeah, I, I found, you know, that reading the book talk, taught me a lot about my own suspicious nature, because as each new person was introduced, I was convinced that that person was indeed the, uh, the, the, the murderer. So you end up really uh, analyzing your own reactions to this. Okay, let me see. Um, Tim Dean, uh, such a great discussion. I'm very much looking forward to reading the book. And I'm curious how the author got the police to hand over their files on the case. That's a very interesting question. Um, thanks, Tim. It was a, a two and a half year public records battle with the Middlesex District Attorney's Office. Um, I filed, I think, something like six public records requests. Another man filed maybe even double that. Um, we were also helped by uh, Todd Wallach, who is a Boston Globe spotlight reporter who wrote a big article about um, the fact that uh, the Middlesex DA was not releasing uh, files on a case that was almost 50 years old at this point. And, and, and Todd has really made his career on showing how Massachusetts ranks, you know, as liberal as it likes to think of itself, it, it ranks near the bottom or at the bottom of states in terms of um, transparency. And um, that case, you know, Todd's article, in addition to, you know, keeping at the, the Middlesex police, really finally pushed them to um, do the final round of DNA evidence testing. And that yielded a solution. And it was after closing the case with that DNA evidence that the Middlesex DA finally released the records to me. Yeah. You know, Becky, uh, an anonymous attendee asked, was the murder ever solved? I'm not going to ask you that question because I really don't want to <laughs> write the book. And I think it would be very difficult for you to answer that. So my apologies to the anonymous um, questioner uh, there. Uh, from um, uh, Andrea or Andrea Piazza, uh, you mentioned in the book that you were unwilling to turn Jane's death and your work into small talk. Can you talk about why that private process of investigating and writing was important to you and how you managed to shoulder the story on your own for so many years? Interesting question. Okay. Thanks, Andrea. Um, you know, I think a lot of the book is about the ways in which um, history is wielded to modern purposes. Um, and I was very concerned that I might be leveraging Jane's story as a way to perform something about myself. Um, and I think in order to preserve the kind of purity of my intentions there, I really didn't want to talk about it. Also, part of it was that the case was unsolved and the world felt very claustrophobic. You know, the first person to tell me the story about Jane's murder uh, turned out to have been the son of the disciple of the very person that you know, the rumor was about. And so it felt like the whole world was full of, of tripwires. So I think it was simultaneously this kind of desire for purity and also fear. You know, I, I, I was very scared for, for a lot of the years that I was working on this book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Here's a question uh, that I think uh, you'll find interesting, Becky, from Elsa Paparamborde. Um, as you delve deeper and deeper into your investigation of Jane's life and character, did she ever let you down? And if so, how? Thanks, Elsa. Um, let, let me give an honest answer to that. Hold on one second. Um, okay. I mean, I think as I referenced earlier, the time that I struggled the most with Jane, um, as a character, as a person, um, was after I spoke to her brother Boyd for the first time. Um, and, you know, it wasn't just that Boyd in that first conversation was kind of refusing to be the grieving brother that, that I think society had taught me to expect of, of him. You know, he had said of his dead sister that she was, she could be manipulative and a bitch. Um, and I was not prepared for that. But I think Jane in, in his portrait of her emerged as somebody who, um, was not faithful to Jim, was not um, necessarily the most truthful. Um, and, and I think in that moment of research for the book, I, as I had said, was so closely identifying with her that I, I was unwilling to attribute those characteristics to her. Um, and it took me aback 
not just because, you know, I wasn't expecting her to be a perfect victim, not that there is one. And I think it's dangerous to, to, to hold anyone to that standard. I, um, but I think what was hard for me was that she was refusing to be me in those moments. And so I really needed to step back and, you know, take a look at my own motivations, take a look at, at whether I had the space to really come to Jane um, to understand the fullness of her, her humanity and complexity. Mm -hmm. Here's a question from Matt Hoysh that had actually been on my own list. Um, hope I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, so happy for you, Becky. Uh, did the emergence of the Me Too movement several years into your reporting change your approach to the researching and telling the story? If so, how? Um, thanks, Matt. You know, so the, the turn for me, the pivot for Jane's story to not just be about injustice to one woman on one night, but instead a much larger story about um, gender discrimination and, and sexual mm -hmm. misconduct in, in academia happened about a year before the Me Too movement started. So it was in 2016 and I was having lunch with one of the people who originally confirmed Jane's murder for me as, as, as a true story. Um, and so I was sitting there with her and it was, you know, now four years had elapsed and I asked her to retell the story for me of, of Jane's death as she remembered it. Cause I was also trying to chronicle um, the changes of the legend over time. And she looks at me and she says, you know, which story are you talking about? And I couldn't understand what she meant because, you know, how many murders could I be talking about in the anthropology department? Um, and she said, look, like, I'm really not trying to be coy. It's just that there are so many stories, obviously none of which are as extreme as Jane's where she ended up killed, but there are so many stories where the man gets to stay and we never hear from the woman again. Um, and, and it was at that point that the story kind of broke open to me because she said, you know, this is, this is truly a disease that academia doesn't want to admit that it has. And she said that, that the Jane Britton story for her had been passed down um, largely from female graduate students as a way to caution against the professor at the heart of this. Um, and from listening to her talk, from hearing, you know, the fact that there were these whisper networks where people would say on, on field digs, for example, people will say, don't be alone with this one. He's grabby. Don't be alone with this one. He doesn't pay, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, I, I came to think that Jane's story possibly functioned as a, an allegory in the sense that Jane was a stand-in for the experience of many women in academia. And Carl was a symbol of a villain rather than a representation of himself. And so it was from that moment that I started to try to understand not just the world of Jane's murder, but also the larger world of generally women's experiences in, in academia. And so then when a year later, the Me Too movement um, happened and, and drove all of these conversations to the forefront, I think what, what happened for me was that a lot of these women who over the decades in academia had kind of learned better than to voice their experiences out loud, that it was often easier personally and professionally to just leave the school, leave the field, leave academia in general, mm -hmm. were suddenly emboldened to come out because maybe finally the world was ready to hear their experiences. And so you get, you know, the Chronicle of Higher Education article about George Dominguez, who was sanctioned, yes, by Harvard in, in the early 80s, but he was allowed to stay in the department for well, four more decades, basically. Um, and it turns out that he harassed, um, you know, 18, at least 18 other women um, and was promoted, serially promoted after the sanctions existed. And, 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 and you know, the, the person who lodged the first complaint against him instead was the one who had to leave. And, and she calls that um, period during which Harvard just kept promoting this man around, you know, whose reputation people had kind of become aware of. Um, the great enabling because it was, you know, proof that whatever difficulties women might face in coming forward was was not going to be met with any kind of accountability on on the part of Harvard or of of the university, and and so you know women were kind of silenced um, 
as a result. Yeah, I should say there's, there's kind of a, you know, sad undercurrent to the book that goes beyond the Jane Britton case. It becomes kind of representative of much larger forces. I think we have time for a couple more questions. I apologize, folks, that I'm not going to be able to get through all of the, the questions. Uh, here's a rather sophisticated question from Anna Andachi. Uh, I've heard that in nonfiction storytelling, one of the hardest parts is not just the additive, but the subtractive, that is what doesn't make it into the final story. The story is so incredibly rich and complex that I'm curious, how did you decide what to subtract? Thank you, Anna. I, I like that question a lot. Um, I don't, it, it, the way that I organize my writing um, is kind of, visceral, um, in addition to doing, you know, the, the kind of standard chronologies and, and timelines. Um, one of the writers that I, I worked as a research assistant for, Likens, um, well, this is public speaking for him, but I, I think of it in terms of writing it to a uh, tug of war. And you can feel when the rope is really tight and you can feel when it's kind of starting to slacken. Um, and so I, I, you know, as I was going through the book, reading it as, as a reader might, I tried to see the places where the rope was slackening. And, and if I didn't have enough, you know, I, I love Elena Ferrante who, you know, writes these very highbrow novels about um, women's friendship, um, but she's unafraid to use uh, these kind of literary devices associated with more pulpy books. And, and, and I think in some ways, you know, my book does that too, where, you know, many of the chapters end on cliffhangers and I'm kind of mm -hmm. unabashed about it. Yeah. But in my head, that, that kind of buys some time for me to then go into the, you know, statistics about the experience of women in academia. But I, it only buys me so much time. It only buys me so much tension in the rope. And so I think um, it, it kind of, naturally cleaved what couldn't fit um, in, in that sense. And then, and then part of it too is like some of the stuff that I came across um, was, is so important and needs to be written about, um, but there wasn't room for it necessarily in Jane's story itself, that it, it, it was a tributary that deserves its own river. Yeah, I think we have time for uh, one more question. And, you know, Becky, when we first started uh, discussing the story back in 2013, I remember you were not exactly sure what form it was going, uh, you know, to take. Uh, so I think that this is why I'm closing with this uh, question. It's from uh, Alma Pilar Gutierrez. Uh, uh, Becky sounds perfect for an adaptation treatment. Limited series? Question mark. Documentary? Question mark. Movie? Question mark. Can't wait to read your book. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Um, I ask that question a lot. <laughs> uh, it, it, do I get to pick my the one that I imagine it becoming most readily in, in this dream scenario? Um, if so, I think it's, uh, I see it most easily as a, a limited TV series, I think, because um, as I imagine you'll see when you read the book, uh, there are so many characters in it um, and so many storylines. And I think TV really allows for the exploration of of not just the kind of central linear plot, um, which the book doesn't really have. Yeah. It's not like the murder happened, I come in, it gets solved. But in fact, it kind of morphs and comes back and is, is fractured in a way that I think um, very smart TV writing it really excels in. Yeah, no, it's a very large uh, cast of characters. And you're right, Beck, it's not just the central plot, but it's just filled with subplots that are in many ways as interesting as the, uh, as the central plot. Okay, I think that our time has uh, elapsed. If you can resist this book, you're a stronger person than uh, I am. I don't think that anyone who reads it is going to uh, be uh, disappointed uh, by it. So Becky, best of luck with um, publication. It was a real pleasure to be with you, with you tonight. And uh, thank you everybody for uh, coming. Uh, Brittany, anything left to say? Do you want to say final? Or Becky, would you like to say final? word before we sign off. <laughs> Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you for doing this. I'm about halfway through the book and I'm telling everyone out there, this book is incredible. Um, give it to your, your friend for gifts. Truly a great book. So thank you all so much for coming. Um, stay well, stay well read, and make sure you pick up a copy of the book before the night is over. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>